very much, um, Terry. Um, as you said, I'm Nigel Fletcher, one of the ward councillors um, for Elsmore South Ward. Um, also here, um, Pat Greenwell, my colleagues, uh, and Matt Clare is over there. Um, I, I would also say, um, just in, in opening, um, our role here, and certainly my role here, um, I'm not here as the council. Um, so I think we've had the statement from the council, uh, from, the, from Katrina Delaney, the Deputy Chief Executive, um, and I think there is an important distinction here um, between us as representatives um, of the ward and the council leadership. Obviously we're supporting the, uh, the campaign and we have done for a long time. Um, I also wanted to say that this is, is absolutely not a political issue in those terms. Um, uh, I see also we have a former colleague of ours here, former councillor for Elton South, Eileen Glover is here as well. Um, this issue um, has long predated my time as a councillor for Elton South. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute uh, particularly to um, New Ligurian and Mark mm -hmm. Elliott, uh, our predecessors as councillors, um, who also were involved heavily in this issue. Um, and they took the approach, and I've certainly taken the approach, uh, that we want to work across parties. Um, I think we had a meeting a couple of years ago um, where we literally had representatives of each of the political parties sitting around the table. There was a Liberal Democrat counts, uh, candidate, um, we had a Labour councillor uh, and us there. Um, and I do think that's important because um, when we have these meetings with council leadership, um, there is a danger um, that this becomes politicised in a party political way. Um, and I would like to think that we're kind of beyond that. I think everyone recognises this is something which uh, your presence here this evening shows is of huge concern. And we've had um, you know, even larger numbers, I think, in the past at public meetings um, as well, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so that's the first thing. But we are here. Uh, really to, and I'm glad the meeting is being videoed because um, it does mean that the, the full record of what you say here uh, will be available to the council leadership. Um, I've been taking notes and, and will do so as well, so we can feed those in. Um, and the fact there's an empty chair next to me, um, I think that's not deliberate. Um, we, we know that Clive Effort can't be here for um, of, uh, unavoidable reasons, um, but also I know that the council um, have wanted to be very clear um, they're not boycotting the meeting. Um, this was a logistical issue, um, and I want to make that clear as, as well. Um, as Terry said, there has been significant progress um, that we've made since the last public meeting, uh, and so that's why we wanted to take this opportunity now, before any formal planning applications come forward, uh, to just update people and to get views uh, expressed. Um, but whilst there are, as we've already heard, some really significant issues about uh, the, the plans that are going to come forward, um, I think we should also note the, the amount of progress that's been made, which Terry uh, outlined. Um, finally, you know, the council are properly engaged, uh, and it's a relief to me. I mean, sometimes it's great to stand up in the council chamber and have a go at them, uh, quite often in fact, but it's even better to be able to actually get them to do what we want them to do, uh, and to be able to support them um, in doing that. Um, and at the last public meeting, for those of you who were there, um, that we had at the, the church hall on the high street, you know, we were told then um, that the council wouldn't step in, it wasn't anything to do with them, uh, and it wasn't their issue. Well, they have. Uh, they have stepped in, um, and they've agreed to take on the Winter Gardens. We were told the University of Greenwich uh, wouldn't stump up the money, um, they were just going to sell it for as much as they, they could get for it, uh, they wouldn't put any money forward. Well, they have, they've put the money in. Um, and we were also told that the fact that um, housing was ruled out as part of the, the plan meant it was unviable, there was no way it could be restored. Well, it isn't, and there is a proposal now on the table um, that stands some uh, chance of, of allowing the site to be properly used. So I think we should, uh, as Len said earlier, congratulate ourselves on some significant progress. Um, and that holds out some hope that we can get a result um, that we all want in the future. Um, and I think also we should thank all of you as well for keeping up the pressure. Uh, those of you who've um, uh, signed petitions, who've written in uh, and who've um, given us their details so that we can keep you informed. That is going to be important as we move into the next stage. So please, if you haven't, please do make sure you, you leave your details uh, so that we can, uh, can update you when the consultations open. Um, I also, as I say, want to thank the Council uh, and the University of Greenwich. It would be churlish of me not to thank them for doing what we said they should do. Um, obviously, there are more that we want them to do uh, in future, but we should thank them, and I'd like to thank Len as well um, for what he's done. The other thing that, that we have been successful in doing is registering the Winter Garden as an asset of community value. Um, that was something that we achieved, was it last year? 
uh, I think, um, and that is a, a legal status, uh, which means that as the campaign group, um, we, we have a role in the future of the Winter Garden. Uh, technically, what it means is that when the site is formally sold, uh, they have to offer it to us first. Um, I don't think we've got the requisite amount of money to take it on ourselves, but it does mean they have to uh, formally consult us, uh, and so that does give us a formal role in the process. Um, and it indicates the level of uh, interest um, there is in the site and its uh, historic value. Um, but its historic value as well as its, its value to the community. As an asset of community value, uh, I think that means something. Um, and that in itself, I think, is a st powerful statement about how we want it to be used. Um, just briefly on the heritage value, um, as already mentioned, um, the glass house really is a, a hugely significant heritage asset in its own right, second only to Kew Gardens. And I think if you look at Kew Gardens compared to the Winter Garden, as it, certainly as it would be if it was properly restored, I think Avery Hill is much more impressive uh, with the brickwork uh, and its setting in the park as well. I think it's a hugely significant building. Um, and to be fair to them, I think the council's consultation where they were setting out potential plans and asking for people's views, it does recognise that. Um, they, they have sort of images of, of how Kew Gardens is used um, and put it alongside that. And I think that is something which uh, we should uh, ensure is, is known about. Um, I mean, I moved to the area sort of nearly what, 20 years ago now, and it was certainly some time before I discovered this gem on my doorstep. Um, and I think those of us who know it, know how wonderful it is, there's a huge number of people locally who will never have heard of it. Um, they'll know of Elton Palace, uh, they'll know the Tudor Barn, um, they'll even know um, uh, Seven Druid Castle perhaps, um, a lot of people don't know it's there. Um, they'll have heard of Avery Hill Park, uh, they won't know the building and they won't, certainly won't know its history um, and its significance. Um, so there's a real untapped uh, potential for it to become a, a proper heritage attraction uh, and for it to be properly used. Um, I won't go over in too much detail the state of play in terms of where we are now. I think Terry's covered that um, very well. But what I will say is um, the council consultation itself was closed. Uh, I'm sure some, uh, many people will have contributed to that. That's now being considered. They will at some point come back with the um, results of that. And that will be an opportunity for us to have a say on how they see it. Uh, and so that will be one opportunity. But I think for the immediate future, the, um, the issue of the school is going to be, I think, the, the, the pressing point. Um, because we know what the proposal is in broad terms. Um, for there to be a school there, uh, the Department for Education um, taking it on. Um, that deal, unlike the deal with the council, has actually been agreed uh, and is pr proceeding forward. So there will be um, pre-application uh, consultation taking place um, and then there will be a planning application and that's where we can actually have a proper say on it. Um, on a sort of procedural point on that, um, and uh, I'm sure it's not a hugely groundbreaking announcement that I'm about to make, um, but um, those of you who uh, know the way the planning process works, uh, it goes to a planning committee um, of councillors who decide it on the basis of, uh, of its merits. Um, I'm on the planning board, uh, which is the main planning committee of the council, uh, and so ordinarily I would have a, um, a vote on it, I have to consider it, but the implications of that would be uh, that I would have to be very quiet uh, about what happens to it before then uh, to avoid um, prejudging the decision. Um, given how long we've, we've been campaigning on this and how involved I've been in the campaign, um, I've uh, had to decide that I want to continue speaking out on it and continue uh, lobbying the council on it. So I'm going to be recusing myself from that process so that I won't have um, a vote on the, uh, the final decision, but it will uh, it means that uh, there'll be no question that the decision could be challenged and so on. Um, that's just a technicality, but I think I need to mention that, um, because if anyone knows the planning process um, and sees me as a, a member of the planning board um, speaking out on it, um, there may be some uh, challenge to that. So having, um, having said that, um, I think that the, uh, the issues as far as I see them um, for the planning application that's likely to come forward uh, are about access uh, and they're also about uh, the linkage between the two parts of the site. Um, we now have a situation where the Winter Garden itself is being separated out from uh, the mansion uh, site and the historic buildings there. That's not ideal. Um, when we looked at it before 
uh, our assumption had always been that to make it work as a heritage asset, you would need to have the Winter Garden itself, and you would need to have the picture gallery, uh, the entrance hall, and you would need to have uh, this, uh, as much of the historic listed buildings as part of one site in order to market it as a heritage attraction and frankly to get some revenue, uh, weddings, events and so on using those parts of it. So it wasn't ideal, I think, that it was divided up in the way it has been. Um, the red line that's been drawn between the part that the DfE have taken on and the, uh, the Winter Garden itself that the council has taken on does include some of it. I think the, um, the common room uh, that's currently being used, which was the drawing room, uh, is included in the part the council's taking over to give some aspect of sort of back office and uh, another sort of ancillary room to it. Um, but the picture gallery, uh, the marble gallery, um, and the entrance hall will be part of the DfE part of the site. So Sorry, I think. Can I just yeah. What's about the, the listed laboratory? <coughs> yeah. uh, and the laboratory Puck as well, of course, the very which, famous which laboratory. Is yeah. in, which is in indeed, the, yes. Uh, which which very suspiciously yeah. survived the fire and the bombing. Um, <laughs> but the, um, yes, so parts of that, that will also be outside of the council's, council's um, part of the site, so that will be as part of the uh, DfE's um, but that responsibility. that is actually apart from the other parts. Yes, it's, it? it's separated out, yeah. so when, they, when the plans come forward for the demolition of the uh, 1960s buildings and so on, they'll have to come forward with their proposals for that. Um, well, it survived the other demolition, didn't it? In yes, indeed. Let's hope it continues to survive all of that. Um, so there is an issue there with access, but one of the examples I look to um, is Dulwich College, uh, where you've got a picture gallery there which is open to the public and is able to ho host events and so on. That's a school, uh, and yet it, it functions as a visitor attraction in its own right. And I think in, in some ways, <laughs> well, it's no, that is, is that, right? is, that is a separate it was a built okay. gallery. Okay, bad example then. Um, I'll, I'll, find, I'll find another example. John's got an example. Okay, but there is, I think, in principle, there is, there is no reason why um, the fact that it's a school should preclude there being public access and community use of it. In some ways, um, and I know that the idea of it being a school at all is, is uh, not to everyone's liking, but we have to work with what we've got. Um, in some ways, the fact that a school will be closed over some holidays, be closed at weekends, closed in the evenings, does allow for the times when it's not being used for a school for it to be open for other events and to be open for the community. And that, I think, is the thing that we need to push for when the application is put forward that the linkage between the heritage asset that the council takes on, the Winter Garden itself, and the picture gallery and the rest of the historic parts of the site should be able to be marketed and used as one site and those linkages um, continue. Um, and the other point is the, is the um, community use um, of it. Uh, it is possible to put conditions on a planning application to require public access, to require there to be community usage, um, and the role of the, uh, the trust that will take on the Winter Garden in overseeing that and how they work with the school on that, um, I think will be absolutely key uh, to how it functions as a sort of sustainable um, asset. So all of those things will be things that the planning committee will have to consider, the planning board, but there is a sort of pressure point here. Uh, the way that these planning applications work is, um, there is a pre-application uh, process where there's discussion between council officers and the proposed applicant over the detail. And so I think having this meeting now and encouraging people to make their views heard is very important. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to make sure that there was no uh, confusion over my role in it, because I do want to encourage people to talk to planning officers, to talk to members of the planning board, to insist that all of the issues, and I know the ones that John is going to talk about, about the specific challenges and that we've already heard from Whitefield Road about the use uh, as a school, are heard in the pre-planning status uh, process. Uh, if we wait until the application is there, there's often very little wiggle room uh, about how the application can be changed. You either essentially have it voted through or you have it rejected. Um, there is a pressure point in this pre-app process where we can have those sorts of issues um, heard. So all of the things that are said this evening, uh, so I'm taking notes, it's being videoed and I'm going to make sure that um, these things are properly uh, put forward to the planners uh, and to the council leadership. Um, but I just wanted to, to make the point that there are, in, in my view, three things that I would want to be uh, campaigning on uh, to ensure they're part of the proposal for when the council takes on the Winter Garden 
and also in the planning application for the school. Firstly, that it's a sustainable proposal, that there is a proper business plan that will support it. So we're not going to be in a situation in another 15, 20, 25 years time of saying it's happened again, that the, um, whoever's taken it on has allowed it to decline and decline, as happened with the university, that it should be a sustainable uh, proposal to safeguard its future. That secondly, there should be uh, an absolute focus on investment in restoring it. Uh, the Heritage Lottery bid that was prepared and ready to go uh, a number of years ago, uh, all the work was done then, it, it's still really ready to go, uh, although there is this issue of it having been split, but that needs to go back to them, and as part of the, the proposals for the future, that needs to be an absolute priority to ensure that there is the, the, the prospect of, of further investment in it. And lastly, as I've said at great length, uh, the community use of the site, making that a condition, and also public access uh, to link the two parts of the site. And those things under the planning process are achievable, and if you want to uh, have a say on that, then please do uh, contact me, contact the campaign group, uh, and my colleagues Pat and Matt, um, to ensure that, that, that we can pass those on, uh, and demonstrate that uh, this level of interest is quite phenomenal, um, and that it's not going away. Um, but there are practical things that we can do. Uh, those are the three issues I think are most uh, important to, to me. Um, I'm sure there are many others as regards to the school and so on. Um, but I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Any responses? Um, yeah. Can I just, uh, yes, I'm Pat Greenwell. Can I just say that we really need to make sure that there is a full public <coughs> consultation uh, on, on the, 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 the school? Because yeah. sometimes these things, you know, go, but there has to be a full public consultation at some point. Mm. Yeah. And I think that obviously there will be the planning process, as you Before know, that. When, when, <laughs> when that application comes forward. But as I say, the important thing is not to wait till then. Okay. I think it is to ensure that, um, that all of the concerns that are being raised are raised in the pre application mm. process as well. Okay. Just uh, like, could, could I take Pat over here? Yeah. Um, I'm stepping back a bit. I, I don't quite understand how it's arrived that the Winter Garden is being separated from the other historical elements. It seems absolutely daft to me that that should have happened. How did that come about? Well, the Who is, insisted that it, that it should be divided as it's proposed? It's come about because the university basically owned the site and that's, yeah, what, they, that, that. That, that's what they've decided to sell. But how uh, can how could the council not push them to sell it in such well, a way that I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. There's been a lack of strategic grip from the council from day one. Uh, they're now playing catch-up. And the question is, what can we play catch-up quickly enough to remedy what was lost in the two or three years after the university said they were going to sell? And that, that's our key aim. But you're absolutely right in what you say. Yeah, but, but there's a broader problem, because I think um, the university didn't think they'd be able to sell the whole site that nobody would want to take on the responsibility, the liability of actually maintaining and running the yeah. winter garden. If we're honest, that's the real reason. So that's the, why it's split. What we've got to do is to sort of try to ensure that although there will be dual ownership of what was the mentioned site, that those connections, what Julie calls the processional route, is actually kept alive and, um, yeah. and honoured. That. And, and yeah. that's the really important fight, I think, at yeah. the next stage. I, I, um, I think somebody at the back there was wanting to come in. Sorry, well, let's try to get the public one. Can you just tell me, please, if the Winter Garden is separated from the other the rest of the historical area, or if it's one listing, if it's one listing, was it legal to separate them? It, it, it is one listing. Yeah. Listed as one? This is one listing, but that doesn't affect the ownership or sale of it. No. And I think, just, just to come in on that as well, I think the, the, the first we heard that it was being split was when the council finally came forward with their, um, their proposals to say that they were going to take it on. Um, one of the frustrations has been that, as we heard from the answer we got from, um, from questions, these were commercially sensitive discussions and we weren't allowed to be told what's going on. So it was frustrating, but this was presented as, as a fait accompli. Um, and, it, and it is the responsibility of the University of Greenwich. I mean, they, <clears throat> they decided how they wished to, to proceed and they were negotiating with the council and that's what emerged from those negotiations. Um, they didn't open that up for understandable reasons. 
but we now have a process that we can be involved in, and I think we need to push on that.